Hallelujah. Are we ready for the Word of God tonight? I got to get here. Somebody texted me and said, did I miss you from another state in another time zone? So they don't understand that we're on Pacific time six months and then we're on mountain time, but technically we're on mountain time. And so anyway, it's good to be here. It's good to be alive and especially to be alive in Jesus. And so if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to, I think I'll do it this way. You can either turn it sideways and the, the letters are bigger. So when you get my age, you want it a little bit bigger. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to get into the Word of God in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Dr. Billy Graham, one time preaching, he said, you have two sets of ears. Your physical ears, with which you hear what I'm saying to you right now, and your spiritual ears, with which you hear what God says to you. And it is my prayer that you're listening with both sets of ears tonight. Now, I was the first one that got saved in this church and kept coming back. The building was no bigger than this platform. There was the evangelist and his wife, Pastor Harold, Sister Mona, the woman that took me, and myself, six of us. And I walked into that little building, and as they were singing songs and clapping their hands, I'm just amused, mocking in my spirit at these people. But halfway through the message, I was shaking with fear and trembling that the living God really is alive. And I was in big trouble. I had to put my hands underneath my thighs so they wouldn't see me shaking. And that night I was born again by the Spirit of God. And I've been coming to this church ever since. 49 years come February. So I say all that to say this, I know revival. I'm part of the early days of this church. I know what it is to move in what we call revival. Some of you, you've heard that there's this great move of God, this revival that happened. Everybody wants it to happen again. And I have been a student of revival my entire Christian life. Every church I pioneered, every church I pastored had a move of God in it, similar to what this church had from the beginning. And I'm here to let you know tonight, I am a walking revival. It was in 1975, I began to tell people, I'm a walking revival. Because everybody that crossed my path, whether it was just working a job, or on an outreach, or just going to the store, and if somebody started talking to me or whatever, there was a divine moment every single time that God put that person in front of me for a reason. And I didn't understand back then when I began to talk about being a walking revival like I understand it tonight. And before we're finished, I hope that you understand exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to being a walking revival because every single person in this place can be, should be, ought to be a walking revival. So let's get into the Word of God tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Father, I pray the Spirit of God quicken your word in every heart. Let a revelation of Jesus Christ be imparted uh, to every person in this place. Uh, Lord, that you save to the uttermost, uh, that you set at liberty those that are bound, uh, and you let the oppressed go free in the mighty name of Jesus. We commit all things into your hands and believe you for all things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And I want to start tonight 
at looking at redemption that God built into creation. Because when we go back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, and it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That is a profound statement because that's exactly what it is, a statement. It is the foundational truth of all reality. It is the foundational truth of all truth. Uh, it is not my truth uh, or your truth. Uh, it is his truth. Uh, it is the only truth. These people that say, well, that, I've got my truth. Your, your truth is a lie. I'm sorry. If it doesn't line up with God's word, it is a lie. If you want to live a lie, if you want to believe a lie, then you're going to suffer the consequences of the lie. So real truth tonight is what we're talking about. And so this opening sentence of the Bible demands as true the existence of God. It doesn't go into this great big thing about how God existed and all these things. It just makes the statement in the beginning, God. He created. All truth begins here. And so we find that God was there before time began. God was there before the universe began. He created all things. Uh, he spoke them into existence. Uh, he had created something out of nothing. We can create things. We can invent things. Uh, we can manufacture things, but we're always taking substance, putting it together through the process, and coming out with whatever we've thought up. But God, He created everything. He created it out of nothing. Nothing. So that's some pretty awesome power tonight. He is the only creator. There are no, not, none others. When God created, uh, he had created angels. We read about them. They're not some little, uh, uh, you know, thing, little kid, you know, with some wings and a, and a white afro strumming a little harp on a cloud somewhere. These were real beings. They had personalities. They had things that they did and that we, they were created to do. And the leader of all angels was the highest created angel named Lucifer. When God ministered and, and, and uh, through to the angels, it went through this one angel, Lucifer. He was the leader of all worship uh, in God's creation. But something happened in Lucifer. He began to get proud because of all the power that he had. He began to think in his mind that he could be God. Then he rebelled. The Bible says he took a third of the angels with him. You can read in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, where Isaiah is writing probably about a, 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 a king of the day, but he used the name Lucifer, and most scholars believe this here was depicting the fall of Lucifer, the angel. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol uh, to the lowest depths of the pit. Through pride, he rebelled. And he brought as many angels with him as he could took a third of the angels. So where was the penal colony or jail cell that God put Lucifer and the angels? Put them on earth. And earth, I believe, at that time was full of darkness. It wasn't the earth that you and I know. But he felt good. He was still in charge, not of all the angels, but a third. But he was in charge. He was like God to them. Things were going fine until the Spirit of God moved upon the waters and God began to speak and create and take this chaos and put it into place. 
And on the sixth day, he created man. When he created man, he created man with a will to choose, right from wrong, good from evil. God gave him a sovereignty. Right smack dab on planet Earth. Things were going fine for Lucifer up until that moment. But God had created a being far more superior than an angel. Put him on the earth with a, with a sovereignty to choose. And even said, we'll create man after our image. And God had relationship with man, with Adam. Every day God would meet with Adam. Every day they would converse. They had relationship because God created it, created Adam for relationship. The devil was not pleased. Lucifer had lost that relationship when he rebelled. And he sees this person on the earth that he cannot touch because that man named Adam had dominion and a sovereignty that Lucifer never had. Couldn't touch him. Couldn't touch him. The Bible tells us that the devil, Lucifer, is the god of this world. So in a sense, he's playing God, but it's all a lie. He cannot create anything. He cannot read your mind. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When that took place, boom, he was out of heaven that quick. Aren't you glad God doesn't deal with us as sinners like that? None of us would have passed the age of three months. <laughs> and so the earth was this place that the devil could li live out his delusion. They were so free until God put man there. And man now had relationship with God that Lucifer once had. And God told Adam, he says, you can do whatever you want, whatever you can dream up, whatever you can, anything but this one thing. Don't eat it at the fruit of this tree. Was it an apple tree? Doubt it. But tradition says it was an apple tree. You can make up your own mind on that. God said, the day you do that, you will surely die. Now, Adam had relationship. Lucifer no longer had that, but God in his creation thought everything through, uh, including recreating man with a sovereign will, uh, and Lucifer uh, could not touch Adam. All he could do was try to influence him because Adam had sovereignty. Adam had dominion. Adam had choice. So he influenced them. He separated Adam and Eve long enough that he could talk to Eve. She ate of the fruit first. When she told Adam, she said, look at me. I, God said we'd die. I didn't die. Now Adam has got to make a choice. Is he going to eat the fruit of this tree to keep relationship with his wife? But if he did so, he would lose relationship with God and lose the dominion that comes with that relationship. Well, we know the story. They ate of the fruit of the tree, and the relationship between them and God was broken. Dominion was lost. And the very first thing that entered their heart when they had done this, uh, the very first thing was to hide from God. In the cool of the day, when every day God would come to meet with Adam, he doesn't see Adam where he normally sees Adam. So he starts calling his name, Adam, oh Adam. And Adam is shaking with some fear and trembling in a bush. They're hiding in a bush. 
In fact, they felt so different, they looked at each other and realized for the first time in their life they were naked. So they took leaves and tried to make some kind of a some kind of clothes or something because they felt naked. Everything began to change in their mind, their heart, their spirit. And when God came to meet with Adam like he always did, Adam was hiding. And if you study the scriptures, you will find that the Bible says that God began to speak words, uh, and in the middle of all that, he slew some animals and took the animal skins, and he clothed Adam and Eve with animal skins with a profound thing in their mind that everywhere they went with those clothes of skin, the innocent had died for the guilty. They couldn't get that out of their mind. Something else happened that day. From that moment on, the devil had influence over man. Man no longer had the dominion to stand against that influence. Uh, and so uh, the devil began to move upon them and influence uh, their choices in life. Uh, and so they've, they've hidden and hidden, and God, he gave them those clothes to let them know without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins, that there had to be some innocent die for the guilty. Because sin always separates. The biggest problem we face in America today is sin. That's what it is. Say, well, you know, they're, they're an alcoholic and they're sick. No, it's sin. When I got saved, we just called it sin. They're a drug addict. No, they're a sinner. And that drug addiction is a result of their sin. And when we called all these things sin, and they repented of their sin, they were no longer a drug addict. They were no longer an alcoholic. Uh, this church was birthed and raised up by a whole lot of sinners, uh, hardcore sinners, uh, that God got a hold of their hearts in a moment's time. And his redemption. We sing about the blood of the Lamb. Sounds so good. I wonder how many in here really understand what the blood of the Lamb really means. It's very significant. So here's man daily looking at the skins they're wearing and how their thoughts are changing, and now there's influence in their mind, in their spirit that was never there before. They had children who had children who had children and were all descendants of Adam and Eve. And we were born into sin with a sin nature. Still with me tonight. So because we are sinners, you can, you can walk in a bar and say, you're all sinners. And oh, yeah, all right, I'm a sinner. And they'll mock you. They'll quote you. They have no idea what it is to really be a sinner. But a sinner is someone that has no relationship with God. If they have no relationship with God, they have no dominion. They're easily under the influence of the God of this world and are living life as a slave to sin. Jesus said in John 8, 34, he replied, Verily, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You do not control your sin. Your sin controls you. How many ever started smoking cigarettes? Oh, wow, what a righteous church this is. First cigarette you had was in full-on rebellion. It was wrong, you knew it, and you're hiding. You just stole them. You start to puff that cigarette, and you're getting all dizzy, getting a headache. But no, you're going to be cool. 
Dude's got to be the Marlboro man without the horse. The problem is, is that as you begin to puff that cigarette, you become a slave to that cigarette. You don't control it, it controls you. And I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over the world over the last 48 years get immediately delivered from cigarette smoking when they simply call it sin and repent. And the thing that got them to start smoking, rebellion. Because the root of all sin is pride and rebellion. That's the root of it all. So if you're here tonight without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a sinner. You're lost. You have no relationship with the living God. You are a slave to sin. The devil can influence you. He has influenced you, and he will influence you. But tonight, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, we have a Savior. His name is Jesus. He came into this world without a sin nature. He was literally God that abode within a human body. And he walked the earth with the confines of a human body. He was 100% God living within 100% man's body. God came down because since the foundation of the world, God knew he was going to have to bring redemption to man. He had no sin. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So we find here that Jesus, since the foundation of the world, when God began to speak everything into existence, it was already set up that he would also come at a certain time in, in history and he would come to pay the ultimate sacrifice so you and I could be brought back into a relationship with the living God. The Bible calls him the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So the first Adam, through disobedience, brought sin and death into the world. Yet Jesus Christ, the second or last Adam, uh, he undone, undid the work of the first, his obedience to the point of death, brought life and righteousness uh, to the ungodly sinner that had no relationship with God. We hear the term being born again. Study it through, you'll find being born from above. Every person in this place has been physically born into this world. But if you're going to have a relationship with God, you have to be born from above. You have to be spiritually born again. And the only way that happens and could happen is that Jesus had to come and die for our sins and take all of our sins upon himself at the cross and then took it to the grave to deliver us from our sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46 through 49. However, the spiritual is not the first but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So God created Adam to have relationship but he sinned, and that relationship was broken. Sin always separates. Two people don't get along. I guarantee you sin is at the heart of it. Pride and rebellion. The 
Jesus died to bring us back into the relationship that Adam one time had with God. And this is the very essence of Christianity. This is the essence. You ask people all the time, why did Jesus die on a cross? Oh, for the sins of the world, for my sins. That's true. But why did he die for the sins? He died for the sins so you and I can be set free from those sins and brought back into a relationship with God that Adam once had. Still with me tonight? I'm just preaching the Word of God. Is that okay? So this is what Christianity is all about. He came to be our sacrifice. He was the innocent that died for the guilty. He was the only one that could do this because he was God. See, in the beginning was, was God created the heavens and the earth, but then you go to John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is creator God that walked in a human body for just over 33 years. He was innocent. He never gave in to sin. He was tempted in all points like you and I, but he never gave in because he had dominion. You study the Gospels, he's always going off alone to pray. Why? Relationship. Relationship. And so Paul is writing. He's up in years. He's been saved a while. And he's writing, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You see, Christianity is not about us. It's all about Jesus. It's Christ in us. Why does God put such treasure in such weak vessels. There's people in here every service, you're coming to the altar. Something's wrong. Something's always wrong. It's the same thing that's wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And you're always coming down. There's nothing wrong with coming to an altar and praying. But somewhere, you need some revelation that'll break you free from sin and the power of sin so you can walk in dominion with the living God and in relationship with the living God. Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the greatness of the power may be of God and not of us. The Christian life is a supernatural life. Everything about it is supernatural. And if you're coming to church and you're not having any victory in life and can't overcome any sin, uh, maybe it's good time tonight to give your life to Jesus uh, and be born again by the Spirit of God uh, and be made alive in Christ uh, and brought back into relationship with the living God uh, so you can walk in dominion. Why did God cho choose risky earthen vessels instead of safe heavenly vessels? See, perfect vessels, if we were just perfect, we'd bring glory to ourselves. But because we are sinners, yes, we can all look back at our life and look at things that we've done and things that we will never speak to anybody that we did. We're sinners. Yes, our lives are a mess. And if all you do is look upon your life over and over again and what a mess you are, you're going to be miserable. But when you begin to look at your life and say, yes, I'm a mess, but God dwells in me. I have this, this light I'm the earthen vessel, and I have the light of Christ inside me. It's messed up as I am because it's not about us. It's all about Jesus and what he's done for us. And that's where we need to walk our Christian walk. I was thinking about Gideon. How many remember Gideon when he 
got his army knocked down to 300. How many remember that? You weren't there. <laughs> Israel was surrounded by 120,000 enemy armies that wanted them dead. God spoke to Gideon. God raised up Gideon. When God first spoke to him, Gideon is saying, well, where is the God of miracles? He's right here, stupid. And he's about to use your life. He went through a few trials to get there, and then he got 32,000 troops together to fight 120,000. That was a pretty good feat in those days. No text messaging, no phones. He did pretty good until God spoke to him and see, this is where relationship comes in. God spoke to him and said, too many soldiers. If you were to beat the 120,000 with 32,000, you'd just walk around puffed up, look what we've done. Too many people. See, it's not about us, it's all about him. So God told them, tell all those that are afraid to go to battle, they can go home. Knocks the army down to 22,000. God said, still too many. I mean, they're surrounded. Do you realize how many people surround Israel today in the Middle East and want them wiped off the face of the earth? Similar situation. God said, too many. So God gave him some direction. Tell him to go down and get a drink of water from, the, from the, the, the brook there. Well, you know, it's always good to have a refreshing drink of water, isn't it? On a hot day, especially in Tucson. If you can find the water. <laughs> but you know, there were soldiers that went down and just put their ma- mouth in the, their face in that water and started drinking. There's others that lifted up the water in their hand. They were drinking it slower, and they had their eyes looking. And God said, all the ones that do that, you set them aside. God took 32,000 army and knocked it down to 300 men. God is going to take care of an army of 120,000 soldiers with 300 men. Gideon had to go through a few more things to con- convince him that this was God. Relationship. Finally, he took, the, took these 300 men, he gave all of them a trumpet. How many ever tried to blow a trumpet or any kind of a horn? You put your mouth to it, <laughs> it doesn't sound pretty at all. It's obnoxious. But they each had a trumpet. I doubt there was a trumpet player in those 300. They had a trumpet, a clay pot, and a candle in the middle. Put a hundred up on one hill, a hundred on another hill, and another hundred on another hill. And at the given moment, they were to break that earthen pot so the light would shine out and blow that trumpet. When they did that, the 120,000 soldiers began to rise up and kill each other. It was God's battle all along. But he used people's obedience to take care of business. Relationship and dominion. Weak, corruptible, perishable, a clay pot. And all of a sudden, this enemy soldiers see all these lights around them and hears this most ungodly noise and they begin to kill each other. I'm thinking about you and I tonight. We're not perfect. But if we'll be broken before God, the light of Christ will shine forth. This is Christianity. 
You see, the presence of God in our hearts and bodies is power. It is power to convert and transform us into new creatures or new creations. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That means uh, the moment you give your life to Jesus, no matter what you've done in your life or what has happened to you or how much of a victim you may think you are, the moment you give your life to Jesus, you are a new creation. And all that old stuff, it passes away behind you because you have a whole new life to live and that is the life of Christ this is Christianity it's a place of dominion you don't have to be a victim of the past this is the power to put God's divine nature in us 2 Peter 1 4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are partakers of God's divine nature as messed up as we are. We have this treasure in us. His name is Jesus. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the power that will give us life, abundant life eternal life. John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So you and I ought to be living an abundant life. We should be walking with a real relationship with the living God. That's why Jesus died, so we can walk in the dominion uh, that comes through that relationship. uh, And we begin to live Christ daily. This is what real revival's all about. They call the Sunday night service here revival service. Oh, I'm talking about revival service tonight. Real revival service. And that's living Christ daily. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you are living Christ daily, you're not giving in to the flesh. When you live Christ daily, uh, all the fruit of the Spirit is flowing through your life. And if you don't know what the fruit of the Spirit is, then read Galatians and study it out for yourself. See, we're living his life by faith. We're living for him, not for us. We talk about revival. We're always praying for revival. Do you know what you're praying for? Revival? To some people, revival is just a series of meetings we have with an evangelist or a pastor that comes in and preaches for a a few days, and that's revival. Let me tell you something. I know what real real revival is. That's not revival. Are you listening to me? I've walked in revival since the day I gave my life to Jesus. It has been supernatural. Webster's Dictionary talks about revival. It says the act of or instance of reviving. Now think about this for a moment, because we're praying for a revival. We got a new church building going to be up and running in just a short while, and we're going to have revival. What do you mean you're going to have revival? What are you waiting for? The building to be finished? God doesn't dwell in this building. He dwells in you and I. That's revival. See, revival, we need to be vived again. What is genuine, true revival? It is when you and I are brought back into relationship with the living God uh, where we begin to live Christ daily uh, and walk in his power and walk in his dominion uh, and walk uh, with God day by day. That is revival. When you and I go on an outreach, 
We're just trying to get as many flyers out so we don't have any more in our hands so we can relax a little bit. We're professionals at passing out flyers. Why not walk in revival? Why not every time you open your mouth uh, and speak to someone down in your heart, God, you brought this person across my pathway for a reason. How can we reach this person? We, you and me, God. He said, I will build my church, and hell cannot stop that. How does Jesus build his church? He builds his church through us as we live him. Still with me? So when I hear people talk about revival and praying for revival, they pray for a move of God. We did have a very mighty move of God at the beginning of this church. It went on for a long time. It was powerful. Powerful. And all that was going on there was the life of Christ moving through us touched my generation that was just as messed up as could be. Real revival is not praying for a movement. If you will seek the mover, you'll have all the movement you ever dreamed of. That's revival. When Jesus comes on the inside, he breaks the power of sin over us. The moment you are born again, uh, you have a dominion in your life that you never had before. And if you will begin to pursue Christ, then you can develop that relationship with God and you will grow. If you're lost tonight and in this building without Christ, or those that are live streaming, if you're lost and without Christ, can I tell you something tonight? You need to be revived brought back into relationship with the living God. Backslidden, once knew God and turned your back on him, rebelled again, life is messed up, you need to be revived. Lost your first love, you need to be revived. What happens when you're revived? You're back with the relationship with the living God. Your Father in heaven... When they asked Jesus, uh, Jesus, how are we supposed to pray? Teach us how to pray. And he says, this is how you ought to pray. Our Father, our, he included himself with all of us sinners. He's our elder brother. He's been there all along for every single one of us here tonight. He aligned himself with us in relationship with the Father. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. And when you get saved, born again by the Spirit of God, genuinely born again, that is a supernatural experience. You're forgiven of all your sins. You're not perfect, but you have a new start in life. You ever try to turn over a new leaf in life? You have a new start in life. It's Christ the life giver, the mover. Jesus walked with God everywhere he went. Even though he was God, he lived for God in the flesh as an example to every one of us how we can live. He had relationship. When he went to the cross for you and I, he became our sacrifice. He took all of the sins of mankind upon himself and allowed himself to become a sinner on that cross. The moment he did that and took our sin upon himself, the relationship between him and God the Father was broken that caused him to cry out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus died to bring us back into that relationship that Adam once had. It is a place of dominion. God so loved us. He went to infinite lengths to redeem us. He gave us himself. And we are of immense value to God. 
I'm going to say these things real quick because I'm closing it out. The power of redemption. We have this treasure, Christ, in us that the power may be of God. You see, Jesus was a walking revival. Everywhere he went, miracles took place. If there was a funeral procession going by, he raised the dead. If someone was blind and crying out, he'd heal them. He caused lame people to walk again. He healed women of infirmities, of female diseases. He walked on water. He spoke, and the elements of the earth came right into compliance because he was God in the flesh. And he walked in relationship with his father. Towards the end of his life, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I am going to send my Holy Spirit. And he's going to bring you to a place of relationship with God. And the things that you've seen me do, you're going to do more than that. The same things, but even more so. Why? Because many of us have a whole lot more years ahead of us than Jesus did. I look at some of you. We thought we were supposed to be raptured by now. What happened? All in his timing, not ours. But I got my traveling shoes on. So I'm a walking revival. I can look back at my life and I've seen so many miracles and I've watched God move so awesomely. I was a young man pioneering my first church in Douglas, Arizona. I didn't speak a word of Spanish and the people in Douglas hardly spoke any words of English. But I was there full of the fire of the Holy Ghost and was praying, was outreaching. We had a young baby. I'd go out and outreach, and then I'd come home. My wife would take the stroller. She'd go out and outreach. One day I went to pick her up after her outreach, and she was talking to a, 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 a high school girl right in front of the library, downtown Douglas, Arizona. She later got saved and became Mike Webb's wife. That's supernatural. I'd been there two months, and I began to pray and fast and say, God, you got to move. And, you know, up until that time, I thought Douglas was, yeah, it's a small town, but it was, it was a pleasant little place. Had good Mexican food at the restaurants. But I remember fasting and praying for a couple of weeks and I felt something shake in my spirit. From that moment on, I realized this is not a quiet little town. From that day to this day, I get near that town, I can feel the powers of darkness. You have the powers of two different nations settled in that little town. Month after that happened, I'm praying. And God spoke to me in a you know, when you stop praying loud enough, long enough just to listen, God will talk to you. Huh? Yes. I stopped and he spoke. Spanish service Thursday night, real simple. I thought it was the devil, so I'm rebuking the devil because I didn't speak Spanish, you know. So I'm rebuking the devil. I start praying again and I started to wait on God. Second time, Spanish Thursday night, Spanish service. Now I'm confused. Is this me? Is this God? Is this the devil? I didn't know. Went through it again third time. Third time. And I'm praying and I start to wait on God. And God says, Spanish service Thursday night. So I made up my mind, this must be God trying to talk to me. Duh. <laughs> so I made up my mind that this is God. So in my mind, I'm thinking everything through as man. 
I need an interpreter. I need somebody that can lead songs that's, you know, in Spanish. I need to get some advertising out there. I need to do this. I need to do that. And all this is going through my mind. And I said, God, in about five weeks, we'll do this. This is a Saturday morning. Then God spoke one word. I'll never forget that moment. He just said, now. The next morning, I announced we're having Spanish service. On Thursday night, I talked to one of the guys in the church. He'd only been, quote unquote, saved. I don't know if he ever really got saved, but he was the ladies' man that sang in all the mariachi groups in Agua Prieta, Sonora. He was in love with himself, but he could sing. <laughs> Said, Ramon, you want to lead the song? Yeah. Front and center, that's Ramon. So he got some song sheets from his wife's grandmother that was a Pentecostal Christian. Then I got Kiko to be my interpreter because he could speak better English than everybody else. And that night, on Thursday night, I said, open your Bibles to John 3, 6, to John 3. I was preaching John 3, 16. Simple, simple thing. I hear this rustling of Bible pages. I look over. He's in the Old Testament. I said, what are you doing in the Old Testament? He'd been saved, you know, about four months. He'd been with me from the beginning. And he, and he goes, well, I, I don't know how to read. I said, why didn't you tell me? Well, you didn't ask. <laughs> we had 28 adults illegally cross over from Mexico into Douglas to come to that Spanish church service. They all 28 got saved. I said, who wants a Bible study? At your house, if you're going to get that many. I had more people get saved in one service than I had in my, other, my church that I'd been working on for four or five months. And I, how, how, Who wants a Bible? They're almost having a fist fight. Who gets to have the Bible study at their house the next day? For the next month and a half, if I didn't have my regular services, I was holding Bible studies in a Thursday night Spanish service. When I turned that work over to a young couple from Nogales Church, first church service they had was 125 people because all the people that had gotten saved was over 60 adults brought their kids. That church never ran less than that. It's a leadership church in Agua Prieta today and has been for many, many years. And the majority of those 28 people that got saved, to my knowledge, if they're still alive, they're all still serving God. And out of those 28, six of them became ministers. God did that, not me. God did that. And this is what I'm talking about. Being a walk in revival, when you have relationship with God, you have dominion, and when he speaks, you hear. All you have to do is obey. Heaven is set in motion. The devil cannot stop that. That's dominion. You want revival? Pursue God. Look to Jesus. Live Christ daily. And you will know what it is to be a walking revival. I've been one for over 48 years, and you can be one now. If you're not already, you can be. We need to know who Christ is because he is the treasure within us makes all the difference in the world. How many believe that? Let's bow our heads in the presence of God.